And so what we'll be talking about in this first segment is, is understanding and predicting the relationships and the rates of consumptions or productions of reactants and products. Uh, so first let's little talk a little bit about uh, about the kinetics. So kinetics are key to doing useful chemical reactions. A reaction may or may not be favored to occur. If you dump the chemicals in together, uh, maybe it's favored that they produce some product, maybe not. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with how quickly the reaction will occur. This, this, it will occur. The speed of a reaction is relatively, is, is essentially independent of whether it's favored or not. Let's uh, many spontaneous reactions, for example, are very slow. Rusting iron, it's highly favored. If you put um, any iron in oxygen, it is heavily favored to go to iron oxide. However, this is a very, very slow process and takes a long time. Usually you need something to catalyze it, like some salt. And so I saw that it's corrosive because it helps uh, catalyze that oxidation reaction. Uh, it turns out that even diamond is favored to go to graphite. Uh, graphite is slightly more stable than diamond. So, you know, James Bond was wrong. Diamonds are not forever, but they do last a very, last a very long time. Uh, in fact, probably a diamond will not convert to graphite in about the age of the universe. So it may effectively there forever, I don't know, but um, uh, the kinetics are important. The kinetics are very slow to go from diamond to graphite. Um, so we therefore need to understand more about the kinetics of reactions or the information about how fast reactions occur. All right, so the first thing we need to do whenever we're trying to understand something is describe it. First, we have to quantify what is going on. So usually we'll be interested in the rate of change of the concentration of A, where A is, it could be a reactant, it could be a product, it's something that's involved in the reaction. So uh, that's written, of course, as the amount of change in A divided by the amount of time that it occurs over. That's the rate of the change of A. Uh, and so we write that as delta concentration A over delta T, um, and we can approximate it uh, if we have two time periods that are relatively close together as uh, the concentration of A at time two minus A at time one divided by uh, uh, time two minus time one. The labels of time one and time two are, are sort of arbitrary. You just need to make sure that it's, uh, um, uh, it's consistent, that you're consistent with what's going on. Okay, so, um, so let's say we run a reaction and we have a way, maybe some sort of uh, spectro uh, spectrometry you're running some um, UV absorption and that you know picks up on whether a given molecule is present or not. Uh, and you measure the concentration as a function of time. After 10 seconds, it's one. After 20 seconds, one, what's 1 1.5. After 30 seconds, it's 2.0. So what can we calculate as the rate of creation of A? And let me pause while you think about it just for a second. Or you pause. Okay, so coming back, what we get is that all we need to do is look at, we pick two time periods and we say, uh, how does A change over that? So it'd be A2, 1.5 minus 1.0 divided by the time that elapsed. Well, it's gonna be 20 minus 10. And so that equals 0.5 divided by 10 equals 0 0.05. And it's important to look at the units. The concentration is in molarity, the time is in seconds. So uh, this rate is in, uh, molarity per, per second. So that is going to be the answer there for the rate of creation of A. Uh, I set up the numbers such that you get the same answer if you looked over the second period as well. And over the second period, uh, the concentration increases to 0.2 from 0.15 over the same 10 seconds interval. Uh, so this is uh, a change delta A over delta T. Um, what does DADT mean? So um, probably you've, many of you are taking a, a calculus class. So this is essentially the differential change in A over T. That's what you get when you make T1 and T2 essentially infinitely close together. So you're measuring this, the, the rate um, at over a very short time interval. And it's essentially the slope of a line at the point. Okay, so uh, let's look at a simple reaction. And now let's let, sort of graph how the reaction be behaves over time. So we start out with all A, that's purple. Uh, at the beginning, of course, there's no B. And over uh, time, we see that the amount of A decreases and the amount of B increases. And of course, these are uh, either, uh, very related. If you look at how these, these curves essentially mirror each other, because for some of A to be created, then some of B must be destroyed. So you can see the rate here, if we uh, calculate, so the differential rate by taking the slope, you can see it's always the opposite of the rate of B. Now, if we look at right here, what's the slope there? 
Uh, the slope there. And by opposite, I mean multiplied by minus one. Uh, that's because for every A that's created, a B must be destroyed. Therefore, over a given period of time, the same amount of A is created as B is destroyed. And so the rates are essentially opposite. Um, so you can see there's a, an important relationship between the rates in a chemical reaction. Um, okay, so um, let's, let's look at this. We can take a look at the stoichiometry and learn how to re uh, relate the reaction rates that way. So the rate of change of A, um, and, and it's important here to uh, uh, have a sign convention. So if we have a minus in front of the rate of change, that indicates a loss of that uh, molecule being destroyed. A plus means formation of. And usually we don't show the plus, it's just it's positive. So um, the rate of change of A minus D concentration A DT, uh, delta concentration A delta T indicates that A is being, uh, A is disappearing. Uh, and that, of course, is approximately equal to the differential rate of, of change of A. Um, usually we'll write delta to indicate either uh, the change over a finite time or an infinitesimal time, just so um, it, we, we're not calling it the infinitesimal time when it really uh, isn't quite an, uh, the infinitesimal rate, uh, the, the rate of change over infinitesimal time when it's you know, actually an approximation to that. Uh, so for example, if we have some reaction where chlorine two is disappearing, we'd report that as minus uh, delta concentration Cl2 over delta T is equal to say 0.15 molarity per second. Um, so that means Cl2 is disappearing at this rate. So usually we keep these numbers positive uh, and, and put the minus in front of, of the, the, the label. So we know we keep track of what's going on. Okay, uh, yeah, so that means Cl2 is disappearing. So you could say, oh, well, uh, delta concentration of Cl2 divided by delta D equals minus 0 0.15 molarity per second, but we usually don't do that. We usually put the minus sign over here instead. Okay, so let's say we have A plus B going to 2C. So now we have a little bit more complicated stoichiometric relationship. So the rate of change of B is going to be equal to the rate of change of A, right? If A, a 1A disappears, then 1B has to disappear. They're related by the stoichiometry. C is a little more complicated. So the rate of change of C, uh, the rate of change of the concentration of C is equal to minus two times the rate of change of A, right? Because for every A that disappears, two Cs appear. So um, uh, the, double, uh, the, the rate of C is double that of A. Okay. Um, so let's let's look at how this works in a more complicated coupling. So uh, I'm going to blow this up a little. So here we have ammonia decomposing to nitrogen and um, uh, uh, three hydrogens. So it's balanced stoichiometrically. So let's look at what's going on here. So we've got nitrogen disappearing as it should, and we've got hydrogen appearing and nitrogen appearing. So that makes sense. Um, and so let's say at this point we calculate. Uh, at this point, uh, we calculate the slope. So the tangents to the lines are nicely drawn there. So that's uh, you know, a differential slope. Uh, and let's actually see what we'd expect the relationships to be. Well, uh, let's say we have the rate of change of disappearance. Uh, uh, so we have disappearance, concentration of N2 divided by delta T. Well, how does that relate to uh, the concentrate, the, the rate of change of hydrogen. But we expect to see uh, three hydrogens for every nitrogen. So the rate of um, appearance of nitrogen will actually be one third uh, the rate of H2 over delta T, right? So uh, this is uh, what the relationship is. So even though there's a three in the balanced chemical equation, what that translates to, to in terms of rate is the rate of hydrogen is three times larger. So therefore, one third of the rate of hydrogen change is equal to nitrogen change. Or we could write it as three delta N2 over delta T is equal to rate of change of concentration of H2 over T. So what we'd expect is we should see whatever the rate of nitrogen appearance here, that's right here, the rate of nitrogen appearance has this slope, uh, 0.97 times 10 to the minus seventh molarity per second. And hydrogen should be three times that. So if here's the slope of hydrogen, it looks visually three times larger. And so 
Uh, oh, uh, no, it's it's a nine. 9.7 times 10 to the minus sixth times three, and that gives us uh, one, two, two, uh, not to nine point one times 10 to the minus, actually this is 10 to the minus seven, 10 to the minus seven times three, uh, four, 2.91 times 10 to the minus seven, which is of course 29.1 times 10 to the minus seven, which is 2.91 times 10 to the minus sixth molarity per second. Uh, yep, and that's exactly what that is there. Let's take a look also at um, the rate of disappearance of nitrogen. So, uh, so the rate of appearance of nitrogen, how that relates to the rate of appearance of ammonia. So for every two ammonia that disappears, one nitrogen appears. So we would have uh, this divided by delta T is equal to minus one half the rate of appearance of and disappearance of NH3 dt, concentration of N2 divided by delta T is equal to delta NH3 ammonia over delta T. So what we should see is that the slope uh, of the ammonia line is minus the slope of the uh, nitrogen line and it should be twice as steep. So here we see that here's the, the, the nitrogen line and here's the ammonia, ammonia, line, ammonia line. Nitrogen is going up, ammonia is going down and the slope at this point is um, going to be 9.7 times 10 to the minus sixth times two, sorry, 10 to the minus seventh. And that is going to be for one, 1.94 uh, times 10 to the minus sixth. And that is indeed exactly what that is. Now, what we'll see, if we take the slope at any other point on this curve, we'll get different numbers, but they have to have the same relationship. If we take the slopes here, then they will have the exact same relationship in their rates.